two ways to pray. Luke chapter 18, we'll read our text, 9 through 14. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse number 9 and going through verse number 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. They were posing outwardly that they were in right standing with God. That they were righteous and despised others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood ostentatiously and prayed thus with or to himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast. He was striking himself, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, or the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again tonight for the precious words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We would love to have been there with his disciples and to hear all of these wonderful teachings, all the truth that he taught people everywhere he went. And we ask tonight that you help us to glean some truth from this, which will help us in, in our view of ourselves as we pray, uh, that will help us to pray better, uh, that we would see how we need to be praying. And so uh, we're looking to you for that tonight. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for the message. And I'm trusting in you for that. I trust in you. I do not trust in myself at all. Uh, we would see Jesus high and lift it up. So we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for each one who's come to the house of the Lord tonight. Bless them for it. And we ask that we will take away something tonight which will better our life of service and worship and everything that we need to do for you. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to again be talking about uh, someone from history that really fits the pattern that we are looking at here tonight. Uh, his name was Leo Tolstoy. He lived from 1828 to 1910. He was the great Russian novelist, arguably the greatest novelist ever. War and Peace and Anna Karen Karenia. Karenia. I wrote down how you say that. Anna Karenia are his two greatest works. Never read either one of them. How many of you have read those works? All right, we got two. We got the educated <laughs> who have read those works. His writings have a moral force to them, and much of what he says is personally helpful. The problem is his morality was not God-centered, it was self-centered. He defined God as the desire for universal welfare. As he saw himself as embodying this desire, he was God. Having so defined God, he wrote in his diary, Help, Father, come and dwell within me. You already dwell within me. You are already me. Historian Paul Johnson writes, there were times when Tolstoy seemed to think of himself as God's brother, indeed his elder brother. Tolstoy once wrote these words, read a work on the literary character characterization of genius today, 
And this awoke in me the conviction that I am a remarkable man, both as regards capacity and eagerness to work. I have not yet met a single man who was morally as good as I. I do not remember an instance in my life when I was not attracted to what is good and was not ready to sacrifice anything to it. He felt in his own soul immeasurable grandeur. Tolstoy saw himself as above the rest of humanity, as part of an apostolic succession of moral superiors that include the likes of Moses, Isaiah, Confucius, the early Greeks, Buddha, Socrates, Jesus, Pascal, and Spinoza. Tolstoy was confident in his own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. The parable in our text tonight perfectly is a perfect fit for Tolstoy. The parable of the persistent woman that we looked at last time, we learned that persistent prayer shows what we think of God. That we are confident that he is gracious and he is good and he is caring. In the parable tonight, we learn that our prayers unwittingly reveal what we think of ourselves. Jesus gives us two prayers, one by a Pharisee and one by a publican or a tax collector. Uh, some people have joked that this is the uh, place in the Bible that defines Democrats and Republicans. They'll probably remove this from Twitter or whatever <laughs> for, for saying that one. Uh, one of these prayers leads to heaven and one of them leads to hell. This parable seems so simple that we often misread it, drawing ungrounded comfort to our souls instead of the gracious discomfort that God intends for us to experience. So that brings us to point number one tonight, the parable. The parable, looking at verse number 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The story begins simple enough. The intended contrast is easy to see. These two individuals were night and day, far apart from one another. The view from the Israelite people was that tax collectors were the scum of the earth. They were the lowest of Jewish society. They charged plenty over the top of the tax to enrich themselves. They were religious and political traitors to Hebrew society. On the other hand, the Pharisees were known to surpass everyone else in piety. And they knew how to interpret the law. They were the most highly esteemed group of people in Jewish society. They would never sell out their Jewish brethren for gain. What a contrast these two made when they went up to the temple mount to pray. The mere thought of a publican offering a prayer was jarring in itself. To read the parable properly through first century Jewish eyes requires starting with a positive image and expectation for the Pharisee because he is, he's the good guy. And a very negative expectation for the tax collector because he is the crook. So A, tonight we want to look at the Pharisee's prayer. The Pharisee's prayer in verses 11 and 12. The Pharisee stood, and he stood there very, he was showing off, and prayed thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Well, he starts out well enough. He is appropriately grateful for the sin 
that God has kept him from. Nothing wrong with that. He has stolen from no one. He had been faithful to his wife. He thanked God that he has avoided serious sin. To Jewish ears, even the inclusion of, or like this tax collector, seems perfectly appropriate. Thank you, God, for keeping me from falling into the awful sin of this publican. Today, we would word this prayer a little differently. God, I thank you that I haven't fallen to what so many of my contemporaries have succumbed to. Sensuality dishonest business practices, the gutter life of so many of the unchurched. We ought to be thankful for God's grace in our lives. I think we are. There but for the grace of God go I. Yeah, a fellow in our church used to say that a lot. His name was Bill Wilhide. Nevertheless, there are some things wrong here. We'll look at four things wrong with this Pharisees prayer first note the prominence in which he places himself the text suggests that the Pharisee moved to the front of the court of Israel within the temple precinct he was at a spot where look everybody here I am listen to my words as I pray tonight listen to me and so he comes to the temple at the precise hour of prayer. He is looking to be well seen, decked out in his phylacteries, and he begins to pray. Secondly, his prayer is loud enough for everyone around to hear it. Thirdly, his prayer was self-absorbed. He prayed to himself. It was a prayer that congratulated himself. Five times he says, I, 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 as we go through his prayer. And then fourth, our discomfort with his prayer peaks when he drags in the sleazy tax collector to draw attention to his own Mr. Cleanness. I am clean, but this guy, he is filth. His self-estimate rides on the exposure of the moral failures of others, and in this case specifically the tax collector. He does not care about the plight of the tax collector, could care less about him. His love is false. He has absolutely no sympathy for anyone else. We must be careful not to emulate any of that. We don't find security in the comparison of others. We must live, Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. I believe it's appropriate to begin all of our prayers in that way. We acknowledge to God that we are nothing, that we are just a, a filthy, rotten sinner, and we take care of our sin as we approach the throne of God. Of grace and then B we look at the publicans prayer the publicans prayer verse number 13 his prayer is much much shorter and much more meaningful and the publican standing afar off way far away from the front would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, this afternoon, uh, interestingly, my wife comes in with a book that she's just started to read. And in that book, she drew my attention to the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who, before he ever preached, always prayed that prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I kind of do the same thing in this chair, but I use more modern terminology. <laughs> I just uh, confess, I am, Lord, you know it, now, I am a filthy, rotten, wicked sinner. That's the way we have, a, have to view ourselves. That is exactly 
what we are. That is exactly what this publican did. God be merciful to me, a sinner. The contrast in these two prayers is te intense. Huge contrast here. The publican is far away from being in a prominent place in the temple. He's back in the corner. He is unseen. His head is bowed down. We talked about worship uh, this morning in our Sunday school class. Bowing down. And, and the Middle Eastern people, when they bow down, it's knees on the ground, forehead to the ground. That is what they did. And so uh, in his heart, that's what this publican was doing. And he proclaimed his sins. There was no comparing himself with anybody else. It was God be merciful to me, a sinner, the sinner, the sinner. He confesses, I am everything people say that I am and more. I will not attempt to make myself better by putting other people down. He prayed like David prayed trusting that he would find forgiveness. He knew he was in a bad place and humbled himself before God. An unknown author took this passage and summed it up like this. Two men went to pray, or rather say. One went to brag, the other to pray. One stands up close and treads on high, where the other dare not send his eye. One nearer to the altar trod, the other to the altar's God. Very good. <laughs> Outstanding. Point number two is the declaration. The declaration. In 14, verse number 14, the first half, 14a. Again, we're, we're reading here all the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now, let's go back to how this whole thing starts in verse number 9. Where, where Jesus, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. All right, so he's probably talking to a bunch of these Pharisees right in the right there. And so he gets down here to 14a and he makes a declaration. And that declaration, letter A, is justified. Justified. The Pharisee strutted from the temple confident in his own righteousness and feeling good. Standing on his own merit but left unaccepted, unjustified, and under God's wrath. But the tax collector, this monster, this ripoff artist of a sinner, he repented. He humbly cast himself on God's mercy, and he left the temple justified. He left the temple a saved man. His sins were gone. God's wrath was turned away from him. In an instant, he had a brand new life, that life that we sang about tonight. He is now righteous by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus makes this possible for every man, woman, and child on the planet. In letter B, we have uh, the Lord Jesus' closing maxim. His closing maxim in the second half of verse number 14. Where Jesus says, For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, or he shall be humbled. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Our Savior is a master of turnarounds. He turns things around. You know, Jesus loved to close his parables with axioms that formally expressed fundamental moral laws of life. This truth is found over and over in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament all throughout Israel's history. 
We find this with Mary as she uh, speaks the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. She says, My soul doth magnify the Lord, in verse 46. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, verse 48. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree, verses 51 and 52. Life, as well as eternity, will present us with surprising turnarounds and eternal reversals. Final points from this parable tonight. The spiritual posture with which we pray in our hearts reveals a lot about us. Now, I'm happy to say that on a Wednesday night, the folks who come here and they pray together, uh, they've got the right kind of heart. Uh, they're not in here praying and bragging about who they are. <laughs> uh, the opposite. And it, it is a time of wonderful prayer. So the posture with which we pray in our hearts reveals a lot about us. Unrighteous hearts believe that they are okay. They are not really bad sinners at all. That's the Pharisee. Now, the righteous. Let's look at the righteous heart. Three things about having a righteous heart. The righteous heart prays with the understanding that he or she is a filthy, rotten, wicked sinner. That is the righteous heart. That is how a righteous heart prays. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The righteous heart still prays that prayer. God, be merciful to me, the rotten sinner. Not just a rotten, the, I am. And finally, the righteous heart trusts in the blood and mercy of Jesus Christ, period. There is no trust in self at all. There is no self-righteousness at all in the heart of the righteous one who prays to our great Father in heaven. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the, the words of wisdom, the wonderful words of our Savior. He always had the right thing to say at the right time, and we see that again here tonight. So we ask you, Lord, that you might bolster our life of prayer. Uh, that you would help us to have that heart that approaches you in understanding who we really are and falling down uh, before you, trusting in the blood of our Savior and your mercy and your grace. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would increase the number of souls that come out here on a Wednesday night to pray. Oh, how that would be so wonderful, Lord. We really need that. It would be great, especially at this time, this crucial time, uh, in our own nation's history. Uh, uh, things are so, so bad everywhere. And we need to pray, 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 and pray some more on these things. So Lord, uh, bless us, make us a blessing. Uh, empower us to pray like never before. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.